uh, my lab is called proteomic big data. Uh, we, we normally we talk about big uh, big data. You are say, yes, probably are thinking about the text, a lot of web pages, a lot of pictures, a lot of video and uh, voice, uh, music and so on. And uh, now we are saying uh, there's another type of big data, which is proteomic big data, which is the key of life activity and the basis of our uh, life. And they are changing and they're generating data. And this data is the key to diagnose disease and to treat diseases. Yeah. I'm so happy about this, Tiana, and I'm very happy because I came to China in 2019 for about a month, and I had some really fun, powerful times um, with the both the people, um, like the hospitality and the love, um, but also with the professors and with the institutions and what they were um, pushing the edge on. And so I did partnership interviews with Peking University in Beijing and also Westlake University in Hangzhou. And this was hugely inspired by also Kirill Piatkevich, who helped make it happen, who I love you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a huge uh, transformative life oh, thank experience. And it's a transformative life experience, so powerful. And now um, about, let's see, one, two years, a little over two years, let's say later, um, Kirill reached out again because we have pretty much laid the foundations for unity, we could say like bringing the world closer together, bringing the world's um, leading scientists and entrepreneurs and leaders together in a, in a greater harmony, and especially bridging together places like the US with China or Europe with China, Africa, Asia, just all together as one more and more. And so Kirill reached out again and with introducing me to Tian and Guo, who is a principal investigator at Westlake University. He has two labs there. And also he is the founder of Westlake Omics, which is using AI powered big data to just try and understand what's happening at this micro level and increase our health and our, and our well being. So I'm really excited to, to spark this fire again with, um, with China and with Westlake University. And welcome to the show, Tiana. Thank you. Thank you, Atlas. It's a great honor to be here and uh, explain our research to, to you. Yes. And we were bonding for a bit uh, before we started the show, and I was just more um, gaining a better understanding of what exactly is um, is happening there, because it's a lot easier when I'm there in person, walking around Westlake University, going to your labs, and actually seeing what's happening um, with the data, and also with even all of the trials and the tests that are happening, and um, the beautiful insights. But when we're remote, it's a little bit um, more difficult. So at least for now, until we uh, open up again, and we're able to see each other in person. But why don't you go ahead and explain to our audience. Um, so what exactly is going on at Westlake University in your two labs? And let's start there. And then we'll also bridge that to um, Westlake Omics as well. Okay, there's a great opportunity to explain here about our research in Westlake University and the Westlake Laboratory. Uh, basically, we are studying proteins and other molecules, which are gears of our life activities and our body. So if you look at your finger, uh, it looks very smooth. Uh, but if you have a microscopy to look at your finger, 
uh, after amplified for 200 times, you will see a lot of cells. It's like an egg. And, and there's uh, so many cells, they are kind uh, of cell reactions. But a cell is not the uh, basic unit of life. If we have another technology to further amplify a cell by tens of thousands of times, now, but let's say, assume there's such a technology, then we can see an, another universe. And in this universe, actually, we have a, a billions of molecules. These molecules are mainly proteins. They're also nucleases, lipids, small molecules. And they are the building basis of cell, and the cells is building basis of our human body. And what we are studying is the movements the dynamics of these uh, proteins as the basis, as the gear of life activities. You can imagine it's so challenging because they are so tiny, you cannot see it. You probably have heard another uh, cool technology from Google recently. Uh, they have an alpha fold, alpha fold version two, which use AI to predict a structure of a protein, of a singular protein. So they develop a um, very smart algorithm. You can uh, pre basically predict what a protein looks like in micro world. It's just a single protein. Uh, it's uh, so exciting. The entire world is uh, celebrating this major progress. But if you go to the context of a cell and the context of a human body, it's just the one protein out of billions of proteins. So uh, basically, we are using uh, some cutting edge uh, technologies to study those uh, billions of protein as a whole. So we call this type of science called proteomics. You probably know genomics. Genomics is the study of thousands of genes, and the proteomics is to study thousands of proteins. You know, there are billions of them, but we, there's no technology to measure every one of them. We can only uh, measure thousands of them uh, in our time, but uh, the technology is advancing very fast. Then, uh, uh, you know, in Westlake University, we are collaborating with a lot of clinicians from different fields. Some of them are oncologists. And in the recent two years after you left Westlake University, you, 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 we are uh, stuck, uh, stuck by uh, the COVID-19. And we also have some research on COVID-19. We're studying uh, why uh, the virus can invade, invade into a human being and why uh, invaded by infected by the same virus. Why some people, they, they just have nothing. They, they didn't even have a cough or fever. But some people have a cough and fever and they are uh, long severe cases. They have mild symptoms, but some of them actually uh, died from COVID-19. Why is that? Because uh, they have different protein reaction to the virus infection. And then we have a, a almost two years of study of this. We also are studying why some after vaccination, some people have a high level antibody which can kill uh, a new virus infection. But some of them have very low level of virus. Some of them need uh, another uh, second injection. And some of them, most of us need a, a third injection. And why Omicron, uh, they, they are uh, different from the original stream. So all these are related to proteomics. And also because of proteomics, it's so challenging. There are so many molecules involved. They are always constantly changing. So uh, we cannot do this by our calculator. We have to use the uh, AI to uh, model the dynamics, the changing, and predict the behavior of the micro world molecules. So this is all our research uh, happening uh, in uh, Westlake University. And also during the past two years, uh, we, we got a new uh, mechanism and also which leading to my second lab in Westlake uh, University, uh, which we call the eye um, marker lab, intelligent uh, biomarker discovery laboratory. And so uh, this lab actually belongs to 
what we call the Westlake Laboratory, which is a provincial laboratory uh, in Zhejiang uh, province. And this laboratory, uh, we focus not only on the proteomics, but also on other omics. And with uh, uh, this uh, other technology, we build up a, a cutting edge facility, which uh, can support research, not only in my lab, but also in other uh, laboratories in our campus and outside our campus. So uh, this Westlake laboratory, uh, we try to establish a new mechanism. Uh, we are not only going uh, from zero to one, but also uh, hoping we can go from one to hundred to thousands. And this Westlake laboratory serves as a bridge between zero to one and from one to many. And this is a, a, another uh, big experiment uh, uh, originated in, in Westlake University. And we are uh, trying to uh, develop an optimized protocol for uh, translational research in uh, rapidly uh, evolving uh, Chinese uh, science uh, society. Slightly different from uh, other places. Uh, you know, there's no recipe uh, suitable for every world, every, uh, but uh, this is something we are trying. And uh, in addition to these two laboratory, uh, we also uh, now have a spin-off company and then, uh, since 2020 in uh, June. Uh, so this also happened after you uh, left uh, Westlake University. And during the past uh, one and a half a year, we have finished uh, two round, rounds of fundraising, uh, for fundraising and uh, we are now uh, have uh, about uh, uh, 80 people in the Westlake Omics. And the Westlake Omics is trying to uh, do from one to many. Uh, basically, we are translating the technologies, the biomarkers found uh, from our research into clinical assays, which can help to improve diagnosis and improve uh, cancer or uh, cancer treatment or treatment of other diseases. And a major um, uh, product we are developing is to uh, diagnose thyroid nodules. You know, we have a, a thyroid just uh, in front of our throat, and it's a very small organ, but it's very important. It secretes essential hormones that maintains our uh, life. Uh, it's also called CEO of the human body. We receive signals from the brain, and they transduce a signal and uh, controls our liver, our stomach, our bones, and our muscle, and our uh, also emotion. So it's crucial. Uh, so thyroid also subject to uh, diseases. Uh, so in almost 50% of the adults have a thyroid nodules. You can easily detect it by ultrasound. You will see at, at our age, many people have a, a thyroid nodules, but most of them are benign. You don't have to take uh, additional actions except uh, uh, sleep more and be more relaxed. But uh, for uh, some of them, they are malignant. For malignant, you can also name it as thyroid cancer. If you have a cancer, then everyone is nervous. But uh, there's a gray area. It's about 30% of the thyroid nodules. Nobody can tell it is a cancer or lung cancer. It's a, so my, it's, a, it's a great challenge and also great pressure, emotional pressure to both the patients and also the doctors. So my collaborator in Singapore told me, uh, so he's a senior surgery. So he said, uh, if he found such a case, he will tell the patient, uh, be relaxed. So your nodule, probably 80% uh, chance will be blind. You don't need to 
uh, do more, uh, you don't need to do a surgery, just relax and uh, adjust your lifestyle. But if he's a junior surgery, so he will be very nervous. He will tell the patient, okay, now you have a thyroid nodules. We don't know whether it's malignant. Probably 20% chance it's a malignant. Do you want to remove it? So the patient talking to the younger uh, surgeon will likely to remove uh, his or her uh, thyroids. But after removing the thyroid, he or she will have to uh, take artificial hormone for the rest of his or her life. So uh, it's so challenging. So we have developed a, a protein and AI based uh, test, which can uh, increase the precision to diagnose the malignancy of the thyroid nodules. And this is what we are trying to do uh, in Westlake uh, Omics. We are also uh, trying to develop uh, uh, AI pharmaceutical uh, technologies to accelerate, improve the uh, drug discovery. Because drugs treating cancer, treating diabetes, and so on, they are uh, the most important, one of the most important uh, industry in life science. So we are, um, there, there are so many involving uh, protein measurement. And uh, this is what we are, this is what we are doing. Uh, during the past two years. Cool. Nice. Yeah, there's so many good things there. I love how you called um, proteins the gears of life. I like yeah. that a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so there's several layers, we could say. Um, so at the level of of the encoding of the double helix is the, um, so that's, yeah. so that's the genomics. And then yeah. you have the transcriptomics. Um, yeah. And then we have the proteomics. Yeah. And then we have the metabolomics. Exactly. And, so, and so then there's the omics for all four of these levels, all the way up to the exposomics, the way that it expresses itself in the in the environment um, and the basically like the the feedback loop that the environment has on the genetics itself so the genetics are are in a feedback loop with the environment feeding into each other and okay cool so then we'll we'll, pro we'll probably talk about that um, and which uh which layer of um of omics, you're most you're most focused on proteomics. Is that right? Yes. Cool. And then another thing that you mentioned that I thought was great was that if we find the biomarkers, so we can use laboratories to find biomarkers, like for example, the thyroiditis issue. And we can, if we identify at the level of the proteomics, the biomarker, right? The one that's showing there's a malignancy that's developing, right? Yeah. And usually you can get that biomarker. Is that, can you get that without a biopsy? Can you get that through like saliva, blood? Uh, no, we have to get a biopsy and measure the proteins. Okay, you yeah. do. You have to get a biopsy itself. Interesting. So then there is like an invasive component to an extent of, of actually having to perform a surgery in the first place. Um, okay, because then there's a level of prediction even before that, that we can attend to even before needing to get a biopsy, if we can find biomarkers about the malignancy developing even before that, that's, that's even better. But I see. So then, if you, yeah, go ahead. All right. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. It is a very important field because in most cases, I have to explain this. Otherwise, people may get confused like you. So for cancer diagnosis, there are two aspects. So first is for early diagnosis. So for early diagnosis, we need a sensitivity uh, in, in a scientific term. It means if there's an early phase cancer, we need to detect. We cannot miss it because if we miss it, 
then, then you will, and the cancer may grow to, too late before you can uh, treat it. So for uh, early detection, or we also we call the screening, we need uh, uh, long invasive methods. Like in the case of can uh, thyroid cancer, this method is already there, which is ultrasound. Oh, because the ultrasound. oh cool. Yeah, ultrasound, you, you have some uh, lubricant and then you can detect it. You will see a lot of uh, thyroid nodules. And uh, if we have a thyroid nodules, it's very likely it will be, uh, it's yeah. likely it's a cancer. And if it's a cancer, it's a really malignant and they have some morphology and uh, the expert can tell directly from the uh, ultrasound. But uh, the next phase is differential diagnosis. Okay, now you have a tumor. But this tumor can be benign or can be malignant. And this is crucial. If it's a benign, I don't need to cut it out. If it's malignant, we need to remove it. So in this case, we need a differential diagnosis. For differential diagnosis, the best way, the gold standard, is to analyze the tumor itself. And this has to be uh, invasive, uh, unfortunately, because the next step will be uh, surgery to cut it out. So yes. for, uh, for many other cancers, early diagnosis is a major issue, like a pancreatic cancer. It's very in a, our body. So you, can, you have to, you cannot easily take a biopsy for your pancreas. So it's very important we, we develop a long invasive or based on blood test to tell uh, whether it's a tumor or not. But for thyroid, uh, the screening is not an issue. It's so easy to have an ultrasound. The challenge, the clinical needs is to differential diagnosis. Yes. Nice. Yeah, so the more that we can find it at the stage of the ultrasound, the better, basically, because then it's um, as early as possible in the detection of the malignancy forming. And yeah. that's, that's our most ideal. And then I, and then when you do have the biomarkers, let's say when you do get into the later stages and you take a biopsy, you find the proper biomarker of analysis. I like how you describe that as like a zero to one, right? So, you know, Peter Thiel's famous book. And so you have a, a zero to one is like the creation or the ideation or the realization of something like that, um, where you find the biomarker. And then if you prove it empirically multiple times across different areas, different teams, let's say, then you can do one to many. So then you can basically take the um, realization that was found and then begin applying that across different hospitals around the world for when they're uh, in that late stage malignancy to then find a, a good method for, um, for transforming it back to its uh, non-pathogenic state, to its fully healed state as much as possible. So thyroiditis is a pretty big one. That's, is that a, like, is that a million people a year across the planet or how many people a year. There are huge numbers, actually many millions every year. Yeah. So thyroid nodules occurs to 50% of the population. And for thyroid cancer, it's about 5 to 7% of the uh, population. So huge. Okay. Yeah. And then, so, okay, so then there's the, um, there's a general understanding, let's say, um, and then it's good because we did a general understanding, and then we also gave a specific example um, for the thyroid, and then let's do another, um, if we kind of zoom back out again, and then we'll get to the, um, the pharma discovery port part as well, which I find interesting. Um, I think when we zoom out again, I like how you describe that. When, and this is a great way for also for us to just get more excited about life biology, um, because when you do this like zooming in method um, and you see, I like how you call it, you zoom 200 times in and then you see a bunch of little eggs that are cells. I think mm -hmm. that's, a, yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. And so you see these little clusters of, there's like 30 trillion just in the body. Um, mm -hmm. And 
I like how that can act as an inspirational tool for young people is to say, well, what's happening at that cellular level um, and how to live a healthier, happier life and also help others live happier, healthier lives. And I like how you also mentioned um, alpha fold also. So like predicting what proteins will look like, I, that's such a huge part of this. So let's, um, and also just the eye marker lab and intelligent biomarker discovery and how different proteins respond to antigens. I thought that was also um, super interesting. So let's talk about um, if we zoom back out at the macro perspective and then we'll zoom back in. Um, so if we, if we kind of see proteins as these gears of life, are you looking at a specific, um, like the specific, um, proteins that, um, like have a greater effect on most bodily functions? So is there a greater, um, more, let's say, more generally produced protein set by the genome that influences a, major, a greater amount of the bodily functions that is more important for, um, for you, for your labs and company to focus on? Uh, yeah, this is, a, there are so many proteins there. Nobody knows countless, really countless proteins, uh, you know, uh, internal micro world universe in our body. And uh, every protein has its functions, not only one function, but many functions. And uh, it's different from uh, the gear in that every protein is being synthesized and degraded. Okay, they are burst and then they are, they are died and the degrading right, to- This is so interesting. So, so the, the protein, um, what's the life cycle of the, of the protein? So, it, so it's the, let me see if I can get this right. It's the ribosome that uh, creates or assembles the, the protein. And then how long, does the, how long does the protein last uh, in its sort of like in its gear state, right? With the multiple functionalities. And then how, how long does it until it um, uh, dissipates, let's say, autophagy? Yeah. 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 This is very, another very good question. We know very little about it. We even didn't know, or we even don't know how many proteins are there. And some proteins, they are, they have a, a few hours and maybe a few days, and some of them maybe a few months, and nobody knows. Wow. There are several technologies to study this, and uh, because this is very important in like uh, Alzheimer's disease, is the because of the degradation of the protein or some protein uh, have an arrow, have a bug, and then it become a severe disease for for the human being for the brain to function. Uh, we know so little about it. So, uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of rules in mathematics, in chemistry and in physics, but there's very little rule in biology because we even don't know how the element of biology, which is the protein function, how, they, how long they live and where are they, how they translocate inside the cell and how fast they move. No idea because we cannot simply cannot measure it directly. And uh, currently we have to measure it by some indirect way. But indirect, so, so, we cannot so say. So one second, so the protein is also, proteins are also moving from parts of the cell to other parts of the cell to potentially do a different functionality also. Exactly. So yeah, when your finger cool. moves, <laughs> when your mouth moves, actually it's the proteins are moving. And that's why your head can move, your finger can move. So, so the pro, so the proteins are enabling like the muscular skeletal system. Exactly, they are actins. The actins, they are there are lots of actins, and they are moving. So then the cell are moving, the muscle are moving, and then your 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 finger are moving. Cool. Okay. Yeah, you were. Yeah, you were gonna say you were continuing to to go on. Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing world. Uh, we we don't we have a very little idea. So uh, we try to uh, indirectly measure the protein movement, the dynamic, so that we we have uh, some idea about it. Then go back to your question. 
So which protein, are there, is there a protein that we focus on? So my answer is, uh, this depends on the question, the research question. So we, we define, let's say, uh, the thyroid uh, diagnosis, thyroid nodule diagnosis. This is a question. Then we try to find out what's the difference between the benign nodules and the malignant nodules. There will be hundreds of proteins that are different. But if you know the key protein, which can be easily detected and easily used to fit into AI model to distinguish this malignancy, that's the protein we want. And uh, if we're talking about a treatment, let's say, uh, you know, leukemia is very difficult to treat, but people found the chronic myeloid leukemia and the, the others have a key protein, which are different, which is this rabo protein, which is a fusion protein. After we identify this fusion protein, we can develop a small molecule drug targeting, interrupt the functioning of this so called uncle protein, the protein causing cancer. Then the, the CML, the chronic myeloid leukemia can be cured to 99%. So uh, that means for every research question, every disease, every virus, there will be multiple proteins being involved. And our goal is to find out what are the proteins for uh, each of these questions. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So so another one of them, let's say, um, if we zoom, if we zoom in for a bit, um, is you mentioned um, the discovery process for uh, things like treating diabetes. And so do we zoom in and we look at where, like, for example, um, we can find biomarkers at the proteomic level that show us where malignancies have developed in diabetes and then which uh, pharmaceuticals and how to design those pharmaceuticals to most optimally decrease those malignancies at the protein level. Okay, uh, diabetes is a very special case. Totally, there are, totally. There are different types of diabetes, there are different causes, and they are also affected by the environment, the, your lifestyle and uh, uh, your food and uh, exercise and so on. It's not like cancer. Cancer we call the malignancy. Malignant means uh, it's a cancer. Just mm. because of one cell become, let's say, uh, initially the normal liver cell, now it becomes um, ca liver cancer. They uh, proliferate from one to two, from two to four. Uh, but diabetes is a metabolic disease. It's a systematic disease, very yeah, very different. But what do you mean is uh, some diabetes definitely uh, occurred through uh, the difference uh, or dysfunction of some proteins. And by uh, correcting the function of these proteins, we yeah. can uh, alleviate or even cure diabetes. Uh, this is a, a um, very interesting direction and we have a project, uh, it's not to cure diabetes, but to predict uh, diabetes. We have monitored about 2000 individuals over more than 10 years. And every two or three years, we collect their uh, blood sample, their uh, stool sample and the urine sample. And we are going to uh, predict, uh, now you are healthy, but uh, how about 10 years later? Will you get a diabetes? We get uh, uh, hyper blood, hypertension and so on. So we build a, a protein-based AI model, uh, also plus some of your uh, basic uh, phenotype, like your weight, your weight, the uh, lungs, and uh, your, your your BMI and so on. Using these clinical characteristics combined with protein, we can reach about uh, eighty percent of accuracy to predict your chance uh, to get a diabetes in 10 years time. Okay, so there's a data fusion of 
different components for prediction of diabetes and then potentially the um, the pharma discovery process for the um, the healing of those dysfunctional proteomic components. Exactly. You know, there are now a lot of AI technologies used in our world to do some prediction. Uh, you predict uh, the pandemic, you predict uh, the traffic, and all this prediction is based on data. And this data mostly from the macro world, uh, you based on experience, and sometimes what we call the intuition. Uh, we predict something by intuition. Uh, but in, in, in our research, we're trying to predict based on the molecules in the micro world, uh, proteins and other uh, molecules. So this is entirely uh, new, uh, uh, new disciplines, uh, new um, world. Because in the past, we have very little idea how these proteins they move, what, what are their change in different physiological diseases. So now we have technologies to measure them and we generate the data uh, of the proteins and then we can apply AI. So that's why uh, my lab is called proteomic big data. Uh, we, we normally we talk about big, uh, big data, you are saying, yes, probably are thinking about the text, a lot of web pages, a lot of pictures, a lot of video and uh, voice, uh, music and so on. And uh, now we are saying uh, there's another type of big data, which is proteomic big data, which is the key of life activity and the basis of our uh, life. And they are changing and they're generating data. And this data is the key to diagnose disease and to treat diseases. Yeah. Yeah, and even to um, get insights into diseases even developing um yeah before they become um cancerous or or deadly basically um so that's that's key yeah i i love this so let's see if we can um zoom out again because i love how you described that um the proteins are synthesized they perform their functions then they degrade and then they can live for hours or days or even months. Um, I love how they're just moving from part to part to, of the cell and potentially performing different functionalities. And just understanding all of that is in itself so fascinating. So there's, so there's the muscle cells. And in muscle cells specifically, there are the proteins that enable actins and myosins for the musculoskeletal yeah. movement. That's yeah. so cool. So... So, so muscle cells, so each cell group, so from the stem cell are all these different potentials for cells. And then inside of all of those cells are different proteins because, um, so, so there, so the, the DNA inside of all of those different cells is encoded slightly differently, um, with small, small, small variations so that it can then make proteins for the specific functionality of that cell type. Can I make a correction here? Of course, yes, hundred yeah. percent. Um, yeah, let's say if you took a muscle cell and a white blood cell or red uh, or a tumor cell, the genome, the gene, actually uh, almost the same. So it stays the not... same, but the transcripted area is what. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, that makes. The so, yeah. Yeah. So so it's so it's like a. It's like out of out of the all of the base pairs, there's like in in each different cell, you could say there's like a little like flashlight on the area that's doing, you know, that you're only yeah. illuminating a specific portion of the sequence for um, this functionality that's needed of that cell. And in a different area, like neuronal would be a different portion of the um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Cool. And also, proteins, you know, proteins are being synthesized at different speed, a different uh, frequency, and also degraded through different mechanisms. And then the, the proteins which we can detect is the synthesized minus the degraded. And this degradation system also controls uh, the protein expression independence of the genes. So it's very important if you want to really understand how life works, 
then you need to measure proteins. If you measure DNA, you can hardly tell the difference of uh, uh, muscle cell and the white blood cell and the cancer cell. Yeah. So there's also a, like a cataloging of from the genomic level, which regions are being transcribed into uh, the creation of proteins in which cells, cell types. So there's like a big library of um, end of all stages. So there's the 10 year old or 20 year old that has the very healthy uh, transcribing and protein development and no uh, pathologies that have developed. Um, and then there's, let's say the 40 or 50 year old that's beginning to get some of the uh, earliest signs. And so there's this big library of data, of big data, and this AI powered analysis of that um, data to, to see like, oh, there's a little area in this specific cell type that is looking like that there's a dysfunctionality at the protein level that's starting. And that's going to cause a lot of other um, downstream bad health effects. And so, so then from that, let's say from that library of, let's say that you could have, um, that we could have, um, then there's also the, like how to solve the dysfunctionality. So it's not only when the dysfunctionality arises, but also the solution to the dysfunctionality that also differs for different like proteins and different cell types and different regions of the body, et cetera. Is that also how you see it? Something like that? Uh, yeah, um, but I can see the library that you mean uh, probably means some location in the genome. Yes. Yeah, in the genome. Uh, this location may be for protein A, as probably A may become less functioning and uh, you're talking about, okay, now we locate it in this location of the genome. And then now we can find some cure for uh, making protein A more healthy. Uh, this is something actually I uh, respectfully wants to correct. <laughs> yes, <please. laughs> uh, because, yeah. Yeah, because uh, most people actually think about life from the genome because the genome is origin of the life. You, you start from an uh, egg and the sperm from your parents, and they, this doesn't mm -hmm. genome. But your individual, after 20, 30, 40 years of growth, and now your individual, and this individual actually composed of mostly proteins. Most proteins are another world. Uh, because uh, you, are, you are also well understood, after the protein is translated from RNA, and the protein has a lot of other additional genome independent uh, modifications and dynamics. Uh, this completely independent of the genome because the genome, we have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes and they're mostly sleeping in the nucleus. Our brain cells, it, it said that they never, or they tell them uh, divide. You have these brain cells and they are, the genome never being reactivated, reopened. They are sleeping in the nucleus, unless there's a tumor. But then uh, how can you get a function where your brain by analyzing the genome, which is sleeping in the nucleus? It's, it's, it's not the correct way to do this. The correct way is to analyze the protein, which are the gears of the auto actions. And let's say protein A, although it's from the same location of the genome, it can be in the nucleus of the cell. It can also be in the memory of the cell. <clears throat> it can translocate in floating. It can also secrete out into the sub -cell, uh, into outside of the cell and go to the circulation and take functions. And let's say if you want to make protein A more healthier, then we need to have a drug or whatever treatment. And this are actually actions through binding to the protein A or proteins 
related to protein A, and so that it can affect the function of this protein A. And the protein function also change if you move, if you have a high temperature, if you are cold, all this can change the function of the proteins. So, uh, so actually we are uh, trying to uh, tell the community, not only the scientific community, but also the uh, social community that um, uh, actually we should uh, study, understand and treat a disease from the perspective of a protein. So we are now launching a big project we call it, um, proteomics driven precision medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's uh, something, something like uh, correcting the uh, inherent or the older way of thinking about diseases. You know, the diseases are classified according to like a WHO guideline or other guidelines based on the patient symptoms. If you get a fever, then this type of disease. If you get uh, uh, overweighted, it's another type of disease. And also based on pathology. Pathology means the morphology under microscopy amplified by 200 times. And uh, more and more diseases are classified based on the genome, like what you mentioned just now. Some location of this genome, which is tra eventually translated into a protein A, maybe is the cause of the disease. And based on that, we, we can predict uh, the disease progress uh, pr prognosis. We can also decide which treatment used to treat this disease. But uh, frequently people found, based on the symptoms, based on the pathology, based on the genome uh, uh, changes, uh, we still cannot precisely uh, predict the behavior of many diseases. And now because you have not measured directly the proteins, uh, which are the uh, gears of disease and line. So, so uh, but why, why that? Because uh, to measure protein need a very sophisticated technology. And the quantification of protein is very challenging, technically challenging. Okay, I love this topic. I love this topic. So how do yeah. we, yeah, how do we actually um, look at proteins? Because we have to go even more than 200x zoom. And we have to um, find some way of like illuminating them, um, but still being able to like capture the data in them and also how they function. So how they like express themselves. Um, so, and how do we, how do we see that? And like, do we, do we have that at like a molecular level? And then how do we uh, like also see the, um, how do we like color it to see the different, um, yeah, uh, the coloration of it, all of that. Yeah, to differentiate yeah. it basically, yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, conventionally, we use antibody to measure each protein. So antibody means if you now you know you have a vaccination, you need antibody against the dead uh, virus or the virus protein, and this the antibody will bind to the virus of let's say uh, SARS-CoV-2, not to another coronavirus, but only SARS-CoV-2 because this antibody has the specificity to bind to a protein uh, of the virus. And this is the called affinity uh, binding and this immuno affinity, this is the basis of using antibody to measure any protein we want to measure. So there's a lot of technologies like what uh, CARO is doing uh, is to uh, have an antibody and they bind to a particular protein. And this protein may be in the brain, maybe in the tumor, and we can use a microscopy give you the color, a pseudo color, that you can see it. You can see this protein is a nucleus, another protein in the membrane of the cell. Uh, but you know, these are the limitations. Every time you can measure only one protein. And to measure one protein, you need to uh, consume one slide of the sample, one piece of sample. You know, there are, I already told you, there are millions of proteins in each so, 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 so Tian, is, is it still the most common? 
is it still the most common for us to um, take in antibodies um, that then have um, the like the genetic sequence for us to be able to like when they bind to the target protein so then they have to go to the target protein so they have to be coded to go to the target proteins um, delivered there and then when they bind the antibody to the target proteins let's say then is there like an optogenetic component or something like that for us to be able to have an illumination of the protein to be able to read it? Is that still one of the most common ways or what's, yeah. yeah? That is the most common way. It has been used for many dozens of years. Uh, people develop uh, tens of thousands of antibody to study uh, almost every protein that they know in a, in a human body or yeah. in animals. Uh, but there are, uh, due to these limitations, it's uh, very difficult to quantify it, you know, you can see it, but how much of it? This is another question. What are they? Is the first question. What? And the second question, how many? But to, to get how many, you have to get how many, because uh, there are many proteins that are expressed both in the bilay and the malignant cells. The difference is the amount of the protein. So to measure how many, the best way actually is using uh, mass spectrometry. Oh, yeah. And this is the core technology that we are using here. So mass spectrometry, like, uh, for example, I can recognize you, Atlas, mm -hmm. by seeing by your nose, face, eye, and the ear, and so on. But I can also identify you by your weight. Uh, if I can measure your weight with a, uh, 20 decimals or 30 decimals. So with mass spectrometry, we can measure molecules with a 0 0.0030 zero plus one wow. kilogram at yeah. precise precision at this level. Then we can simply by measure the weight, we can get the identity of the protein. And this is a, all, this is a theoretical basis for uh, mass spectrometry based the protein measurement. And with a tiny amount of tissue, which you can hardly see, we can measure tens of thousands of proteins. And this is, cannot be achieved by any other technologies uh, right now. And with this technology, then we can actually uh, measure uh, many hundreds, thousands of samples which are belying and with uh, another batch of sample, which are malignant of different uh, severity, then we can use AI to find out what are the different proteins and uh, uh, how much are they and uh, find uh, biomarkers and build AI models to uh, distinguish them. So building AI models to distinguish at the level of 30 decimal places using mass spectrography, um, so spectrometry, um, yeah. so, so, so then, um, so the different molecular weights basically will tell you um, which molecules are present and, yeah. and, then, um, and then how much of them also in the protein. And then if, so then if there's like a 17 year old, let's say, um, there's supposed to be like a normal level of all molecules present in the protein. But if there's a 45 year old that is beginning to have one amount of molecules higher than the other, that could be an indicator for pathology dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. We also have a product of aging. We measure the proteins in different organs along the lifetime of a mouse. And then we can see differences, uh, how different organs are getting old. And uh, when they get old, will liver get old? What are the proteins which are changed? Will uh, stomach getting old? Will brain getting old? Uh, what yeah. are the differences? Yep. That's so cool. And then, so then, um, so I love that. So the stomach, the brain, the muscles, just the different areas when they get old in this library, you could say, is the data that shows that um, in those different regions, 
there's usually this a molecule will get uh, too much of in the protein or whatnot. And so there's, there'll be like a pattern analysis that we'll have in this library um, to predict dysfunctionality. Mm -hmm. So would you say that when we, when we predict um, the dysfunctionality, let's say um, I have my uh, levels, um, you have your levels, um, there's young kid levels, there's older people levels, and they're all interestingly different, um, even in the same, let's say, area of um, the stomach cell, and that the stomach cell has a specific um, composition of, of uh, molecules that is supposed to be there at a healthy state. And then when there's a, um, a dysfunctionality in the, at, the, at the level of uh, molecules, again, it's so cool. So mass spectrometry will tell us that there's that, that, there's that dysfunctionality okay. developing. And then, so then what would be your solution then? So is this where the, the AI um, big pharma component comes in to, to do this like testing on those regions, that kind of thing to see if it can um, bring it back to homeostasis or, or what? Yeah, so, you know, disease or aging actually evolves from the molecular basis, basically the protein level and to the cellular basis. So that, which means uh, when you get the air old, your protein change first. And then you will, at the time, you don't see any other difference by looking at your face. You don't see any difference by looking at your finger up to under microscopy. The cell, they're the same, but the protein is getting old. But then after a certain threshold, after reaching some threshold, you begin to see the difference at the cell level. And then after a certain time, then you start to see uh, from the macro level, your face or your hair become seems different. So if we have the ability to, if we have a glass, okay, we can see, if you have a camera, we can see you from the other end of the world. But if we have the proteomic technology, we can see changes, so subtle changes, which will precede the macro field change. And this is the, all the basis for, for us to um, manage diseases. For example, if we are cancer patient, they, they, they are already diagnosed with a cancer. And we want to know whether, which drug should be used to treat this cancer. The ordinary practice is treated with drug A because drug A is effective in 80% of people, patients like he like this patient. And then we treat it, then after three months, we do a CT or six months, do a CT to see whether the tumor shrink. Initially so big, now it shrink. If it shrink, okay, successful. Well, we should continue to use this drug. If it doesn't shrink or it even grow, okay, we waste three months. So the idea is if we have a um, cutting edge proteomic technology and AI model, then we can maybe tell at one week or two weeks before the tumor shrink or grow, we already can see protein level change because every drug, they're actioning through some proteins or multiple proteins. And the, the key is we don't know which protein it will, the drug will bind to because they will, they, we know some of them. We know maybe every drug developed uh, have some, what we call the MOA, mode of action. We know something about it, but we don't know everything. We don't know how much change this drug will induce to affect the protein. And this is what we are doing. And this change can be quantitative change, can be used to build an AI model. And this model can predict whether it drink three months. And this is a, a, the, this is the principle of uh, how I envision that uh, this will work in clinic. And uh, this is uh, also what we are trying to do uh, with uh, a few clinical trials 
uh, with the ovarian cancer, with the uh, triple negative breast cancer, and uh, thyroid cancer, and so on. Interesting. So in the later stages, um, like you're describing now, is the like is developing as as best of a pharmaceutical remedy as possible, deploying that and then analyzing the cancer and seeing if it's decreased. So that's later stage. And then earlier stage is um, potentially the like as best as we can creating like computer simulations of the of what it would look like to um, to bring in some sort of like you know everyone's been you know feeling the whole thing of like what can I actually like take that can like boost the biology of my vehicle like what like what could actually boost like the entirety of it not only cognitively metabolically etc all of it um, and so. Um, is there something that we could be, in a sense, um, even before it gets to cancer or tumor or malignancy, could we go even like running these simulations, let's say, where even at the beginning level of like a molecular um, uh, increase or, or decrease um, from the normal, let's say, from what it's supposed to be, that then we could um, have in that simulation, is this pharmaceutical or is this specific um, remedy that we're applying, is it actually able to bring us back to homeostasis, to like to full health or even better than that? Um, and so I, I love that. And that that's also that's also really exciting. And it feels like um, it feels like it feels like anticipating um the future more than um, waiting until the later stages of the disease kick in, like basically tackling aging at the level of, like you said, prote protein dysfunctionality um, before it even ha like really as it's starting, basically as it imbalances. Yeah. 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 So the human being is a huge machine composed of trillions of cells, and each cell has a countless proteins. If we can measure the protein, we know the secret of how the machine runs, and we can predict the micro world behavior of this uh, huge machine. Yes. But this is not easy, so this is our vision. Uh, we still need to accumulate sufficient data, big data, before we can have a reliable AI model to predict such a sophisticated system. So, you know, uh, we have uh, more than 7 billion individuals in the earth, on Earth. And eight, we are more than eight now. Eight now, okay. Yeah. That, that is still a small number compared to the proteins in one single cell. <laughs> you think so? Are there more than 8 billion proteins in a single cell? Sure. Yeah. Really? I heard last well, time that it was like thousands of different proteins. Um, but so, so there could be like, you, you're saying there could be like millions of each one of those thousands or something like that. Um, yeah, there are, there are a huge number. I didn't know that we were talking over billions in each cell, billions of proteins. Yeah, there are uh, more than that. It's estimated, or no, nobody knows how many, but you know, there are millions type of proteins. And for each protein, there are uh, multiple copies. Yeah, interesting. So millions of millions of types, and then um, there are multiple copies. Cool. That's crazy. Woo. In each cell. Yeah, each cell. God, that's nuts. Um, okay, so I have a couple more questions. Um, so one of them is, um, do you want to share anything else about um, the way that like Westlake um, is like um, 
about your lab that has uh, about, I think you said 30 or so um, people right now, or also about um, Westlake omics and how it has like 80 or so people right now, and how you're providing these um, conventional applications, uh, translating the scientific um, insights. Do you want to talk about anything else about that funnel or that process or about how you're like recruiting for it or creating like international relationships for it? Um, do you want to share anything else about that? Yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, we are collaborating a lot with uh, international um, collaborators. We have actually very nice um, facility and also exciting with such topics. We hope uh, more people could join us in either in uh, Westlake University, Westlake Laboratory, also the uh, Westlake Omics for uh, this exciting research and application. So uh, I'm also um, the general secretary of the Chinese Society for Human Proteome organization and um, we are uh, gathering a bunch of um, exciting passionate young scientists they're graduate students they're postdocs um, they are willing to uh, communicate with uh, other colleagues peers uh, outside china uh, and uh, we are initiating a big science project with uh, Professor Fu Chu He in uh, Beijing, which is funded by uh, most Minister of Science and Technology in China. We are really hoping to uh, collaborate with uh, uh, clinicians, uh, healthcare practitioners, and AI scientists all over the world to move forward at this uh, exciting proteomic big data research. You know, uh, this cannot be achieved by a single group by a single country. And the benefit will not only be uh, belong to you know, Hangzhou or China, it's uh, for the sake of uh, the entire uh, human being. Uh, after we solve any disease like a thyroid cancer or leukemia or ovarian cancer, it will be helpful for anyone uh, in the world. However, uh, there are indeed a lot of challenges. You know, uh, most people, they understand uh, genomics. And uh, very few people really know uh, what, what is a protein, uh, how many proteins are there, and how sophisticated they are there, how dynamic are they are, and uh, how to measure them, and how, to, how can we use that for uh, disease diagnosis and therapeutics. And these are all open questions, and uh, we need the education uh, to, so that pe more people can understand. And this is particularly important for application of this technology in a clinic, because you know, uh, clinic uh, diagnosis is not something like an iPhone. You invent an iPhone and you can sell in the market. So we develop a biotechnology, we develop a drug, we need to get a proof from the authorities like uh, FDA in US uh, or and the Chinese NPA and so on. And we need to uh, let them understand uh, what's the gears of life and what's the basic molecular basis of the uh, therapeutics. And uh, this will need some time. It will not take a long time, but uh, you know we still need uh, some explanation why uh, why protein uh, is the molecule that we should measure. And uh, uh, AI is also uh, some people have concern. So AI, most people think, okay, it's powerful, but uh, it looks like a black box. What's inside AI? Can you explain to me uh, how do you use this protein and then you get a score, but a risk score for, for, but this, you know, this need a different logic. And many people think mutation of a gene is the cause of a, pro of a disease. Then uh, if you measure protein, what mutation it corresponding to? And you know, uh, for, for this type of um, question, and we have to tell them, okay, uh, just like what we, I did to you during the past uh, one hour, the uh, protein have a different uh, logic. Proteins are, uh, you know, there are many copies that are changing, they are being set aside and they're being degraded. 
And uh, all this we need uh, mm, help from you and many other uh, colleagues uh, from different fields. Uh, first, uh, you should uh, uh, maybe uh, understand uh, this uh, science and understand uh, now we can do a lot of uh, cool uh, protein measurements. So I started to protein uh, research uh, more than 10 years ago, studying in Singapore. At that time, uh, the protein measurement is uh, very expensive, much, much more expensive than what we have now, and also not very precise. So now everything changed, but many people, they are still, uh, some of the scientists who has done proteomics in the past, they have this the older impression, okay, proteomics is expensive and uh, not very precise and they didn't know now it's changing so we are talking a lot to uh, scientists in china uh, we have been interviewed for by many times to explain this after normally after one hour or, or so uh, they will uh, understand now it's different it's a different uh, field and they have a lot of cool technologies but uh, uh, to the um, uh, international community um, we also need such uh, uh, education. So I'm also involved in uh, HUPO, which is the International Cons Organization for Human Protein. And there are scientific peers from different countries. Uh, if you look at 10, uh, 20, about 20 years ago, uh, proteomics get a lot of support from academia, from industrial, and, uh, and they are having very good uh, uh, research uh, outcome and they are, have a high expectation from many fields saying that proteome is going to change the world. But, uh, you know, during the past uh, 15 years, uh, there are a lot of frustrations because of the immature technology and overclaims and so on. Uh, so uh, in many countries, actually, uh, people are not very supportive of proteome research. So this makes very uh, our, uh, many of our peers in other countries uh, re relatively tough. Uh, but recently, uh, you probably heard uh, pr President Joe Biden, he uh, relaunched the Cancer Moonshot project on the 2nd of February. And uh, one major uh, project in this uh, initiative is called the CP Tech, the Clinical Proteomics Analysis of uh, cancer tissue consortium. And uh, this project actually uh, is mainly proteomics. And uh, the director, Henry Rodriguez, is also our uh, long-term uh, collaborators. When I was in Zurich and Sydney, actually we joined uh, Cancer Moonshot uh, uh, via uh, Switzerland, UK, and uh, uh, Australia. So uh, this uh, uh, Biden, President Biden also joined our Hupo meeting, I think 2019, I don't know, sorry, it's 2016 or so. So he, he spoke in the Proteum uh, meeting, annual meeting, and also hold a great promise for the field. So uh, with your uh, kind uh, interview, I hope to also advocate uh, the uh, maybe more understanding of the uh, proteomics field, which has changed um, dramatically during the past couple of years. And now we really have a practical technology to use for clinic. And we have a, a, a lot of companies, um, like uh, our company Westlake Omics, are uh, equipped with cutting edge proteomic technology and AI models, which can provide uh, practical uh, assays to uh, treat some diseases such as thyroid nodule diagnosis. So we, we also uh, hope to uh, expand our, uh, so before this test can be a proven clinic as a IVD, in vitro diagnostic tools, it will also an LDT, lab development technology, LDT. So we hope also to um, test our LDT as a research phase in different places in China and also maybe overseas. 
have friends in California, in Stanford, and uh, we are talking to them because they have a quite mature um, industry for LDT. So uh, in, in contrast, China is just starting to develop LDT. So regulation is not uh, really mature. So hopefully through the collaboration, scientific collaboration between different countries, uh, China and the US, they are not uh, competitors, but they are actually we can, our scientists can work together to promote uh, the, uh, the, the healthcare like uh, President Joe Biden said, he wants cancer uh, mortality decreased by 50% or 25% in, 20, in 25 years, maybe 50% by 25 years. So uh, no country can do this by, by their own. And uh, the benefit will benefit the entire human being, not only uh, United States, but also Europe and China. So uh, I hope uh, through the collaboration between uh, scientists, uh, so technology, we have so many collaborators in, in the States, and I really hope you can one day come to here and see what we are doing and uh, uh, also um, have some our voice heard by uh, not only um, the people in our field, but also by the uh, ordinary people, by the patients, uh, to uh, have them aware of these uh, new technologies. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and I feel like that's one of the main goals is to um, make it so that we don't have um, data silos around the planet, um, but rather that there's data interoperability across labs and across um, institutions. And then that we can leverage that data interoperability to be even more like a single unified planetary force and um, do things like decrease the amount of people dying by cancer because we've in, because we've increased our data interoperability. Um, very similar with like cellular communication as well. So you know, mm -hmm. yeah, on the micro levels, the same thing on the macro level, um, yeah. as, as above, so below, and um, and the other thing that you mentioned that I really uh, respect a lot is the patients, right? So the people and the, the average like population who would love to um, hear and learn more about this because it's going to be so applicable when let's say they have a family member going through a disease of some sort for them to know, oh, hey, I remember that there's actually these important labs doing this work and maybe I can um, get involved in what they're doing so that my family member can live longer so they can be healed or whatnot, whatever it is. So I love that also. Um, so yeah, hugely excited about the, um, the international uh, collaborations and data interoperability and success moving forward as a unified planet, as well as getting this out to the masses via even content like this and, and beyond, just making it more and more um, friendly and simple for us to understand about the advances that are happening and how they can be applicable for our lives. So, exactly, so we're going to host a meeting in collaboration with New England General Medicine uh, and also Cancer Hospital in China, uh, we are focusing on uh, molecular diagnosis of thyroid cancers. Yeah. And we have invited all the uh, opinion leaders in China and also in the United States, in Harvard, uh, in Montgomery, uh, Snow Catherine, and also people from California. I mean, a, a professor in Japan who is a, a major contributor to the WHO guideline for thyroid nodule uh, diagnosis. So we will meet together, uh, some of them virtually uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, hopefully next year we can gather uh, physically. So we're going to talk about uh, current status of thyroid nodule diagnosis and what are the existing technology, what are the limitations, if any, and uh, what are the emerging technologies uh, to uh, have a better management of this disease. And we're also trying to interview some of the patients. There are so many patients uh, in yeah. China. And if you're actually, if you're interested, probably can uh, join our events 
and uh, yeah. uh, do something, some interview some people in the States or in, uh, I believe a lot of people will have thyroid nodules. You just ask them uh, what they think about it, about it. Have they cut it? Uh, have, uh, have, uh, have they have, do they have concern about it? And what are their concerns? And we're also trying to uh, make some uh, cartoon uh, in both Chinese and English to explain the what's the thyroid and what's the biology and what are the disease of this uh, thyroid um, organ. And uh, I think that would be very, very interesting. Every year, there are millions of people have their thyroid cut out, removed. And uh, after remove, removal, they found that actually they didn't have to. This is simply because there's no precise diagnosis method. Yeah, and this sounds great. This sounds like a, an awesome um, upcoming event in March for, for doing exactly what we just said, bringing us closer together, creating more interoperability um, between data um, healing more people around the world. So that's great. And I do feel like there's going to be a lot more, um, opportunities for us to, to collaborate and create together and just to, you know, re-spark our relationship, uh, with Westlake as well as, um, China at large. And, um, it's exciting for me to bring a greater sense of unity together and, uh, meeting basic needs and actualizing everyone's full potential. And, um, it just, you know, that's what drives my heart and that's what drives our heart. Um, that's why we do what we do. So thanks so much for coming on the show, Tian. And thank you, brother. Oh, thanks so much for your time. I'm really glad to talking to you. Haven't talking to uh, uh, foreign friends for a long time in such a casual way. Yeah, you actually invited me to talk a lot more than what I have thought about. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, that's always also um, exciting is when um, you feel like we had a good conversation for your further ideas and creativity. That's always very yeah, important. Yeah. Yeah, you have a very nice summary every time when I uh, talk about something and this uh, uh, inspired me to talk about more. <laughs> cool. Yeah. That's great. And, and also the nuances where you like helped correct uh, and make it more clear that we were, that I was actually um, knowledgeable about the, the central dogma of biology. So just, I appreciated your corrections also. <laughs> Those were very important. Um, thank you. Yeah, that, that's my job. Hey, yeah. Do you have any uh, website of your company that I can uh, learn more about what you are doing? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so one of the uh, main ones um, that I'll send you is the uh, No Limits Society. So that's the main thing that we're building. And then, of course, Simulation, which is the show, the show that I host. Um, so yeah, so I'll send you those links, of course, and I'll have them in the bio as well. I'll also put um, the links to uh, the Gulmix.com uh, as well as the Westlake Omix dot com mm -hmm. links in the bio for people to check out and and also if you guys would like to you can leave us a comment below with your thoughts on the episode we would love to hear from you um you can oh. also you can also like the video to help the algorithm subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet um share the video if you think this conversation about proteomics about big data um if you think this has been helpful go ahead and share this with other people that you feel like this would resonate with and um, check out the links in the bio below to Tianan's work. And if you want to get involved in their international collaborations, um, if you want to re reach out um, to create together with them, feel free to, um, to dive deeper into what they have available online. And yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it. Do you have anything mm. else you'd like to add? Yeah, that's a very nice. And uh, I have a team. Uh, now they are not here. Later, after you send me this information, uh, we, we will. Uh, well, I will work with my team to uh, see how to collaborate with, with you in the future, maybe in more extent, uh, in a March meeting or uh, more events um, that we are going to uh, do. So I first read your information, and then uh, let's uh, think about uh, if we have more. Uh, opportunity to work together, we can schedule another meeting uh, to discuss about it. Yeah, sweet. Mm -hmm. 
Sweet. Okay. Um, Thanks. Cool. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end our um, just the recording. So just stay in the room for one more minute with me, okay? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We love you. See you soon. <laughs>